Hi, this is Dave McComb from Semantic Arts. It's March 7th, 2019. We're at the GIST Council, and today we're going to talk about the T box, the C box, and the A box, how that relates to GIST. And, you know, most of the folks on the call are familiar with the terms T box and A box, although I was wondering just how, when they got cooked up, and how familiar they were. I went and did a little bit of a search, I got to, to this point. Or is it there? Uh, 1993, that was the first thing that came up, actually. An article by Tom Gruber. This is the same Tom Gruber of Siri fame. You know, he created Siri, and they were acquired by Apple, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and he wasn't coining the term in 1993. He was just using it as if it had been around forever, and probably has. And so I'm, I didn't bother to go any, any further back than that. Um, I also found a nice, concise little definition here of, of what is a T-box and an A-box. This guy said that a, a T-box is the is the schema axioms. You know, we know it as the terminological box. It's where we make up new terms. It's where we make up classes and properties and then declare what it is they mean. And in his example here, he says a doctor is a, is a subclass of, a, of person and that a happy parent is equivalent to a person and all of their children are either doctors or they have children who are doctors. That's all the you know, funny upside down letters and stuff. But so that would be your T box. That's where you're saying, you know, what what the terms mean. And then the A box are the grounded facts, like declaring that John is a happy parent or declaring that John has a child, Mary. And in this guy's opinion, a knowledge base is just the two of those put together. Or to put it another way, this is this famous uh, syllogism here. If we, if we said, as it has been said for thousands of years, that all men are mortal, that's a T-box kind of a statement where we're creating a, a class called the set of all men, and we're creating another class, the set of all mortals, and we're declaring a relationship between them that Man is a subclass of mortal, so we've got our T box established. And we come along and say Socrates is a man. Uh, so the first thing we're saying is he's a named individual. He's in the A box. Now it's interesting. For thousands of years, we've gotten this wrong. We said Socrates is a man. We really should be saying Socrates is a men. But that would sound weird. So we need another act. We need another uh, thing in our T box to say man and men are equivalent classes, but so we say Socrates is a man, it's another A box ground fact, and then we run our inference engine and we can infer that Socrates is immortal, and that's in the inferred A box. <clears throat> so just for a little bit of level setting with the what the T box and the A box is, why we even uh, talk about it, why, why do we discuss the fact that they're separate? It's kind of weird because in a, in a traditional system, they're absolutely separate, you know? In a traditional system, there's data definition language and data manipulation language. Or data, man, whatever it is, SQL. Um, and, and weirdly, even though they are separate, they're inseparable. In other words, you can't have data without the schema, and schema without the data is kind of useless. I mean, they're, they're bound together in a weird sort of way. <clears throat> Whereas with the semantics, they're, they're more similar than different. You know, everything is a triple. All Everything in the T box and the A box, it's one mechanism. It's all triples, and you can traverse right through from, from instances right up to the classes. And even though they're similar, they are separable. Um, we can apply a different worldview. We can put a different T box on the same ground facts. And you really can't do that in relation. You can't pick up a, one scheme and say, gee, I wonder what the, that table would look like if I put another schema on top of it. I mean, that's just such a weird thing to even say. So as you may recall from a couple of months ago when we had the uh, Just Council session on bank accounts, and if you haven't seen that one, go back and find the video. I think it was a pretty good one. But I wanted to reiterate what we were covering there. We, we had these ground facts, and, and 
can't quite read it here, but in the green, there's three organizations, Semantic Arts, our bank, and, and uh, PayPal, really. And then three uh, different accounts in yellow. But these are, and, and then the white stuff is either some email addresses or bank balances, things like that. These are the ground facts, and, and you know, as you can imagine, they're just true that there is a bank account and it does have a particular balance. However, we first put one T box on it and said, from the lens of Semantic Arts, that account number 1401 is an asset. And it is, you know, it's our bank account. We consider that to be an asset. When you take the lens or a different T box of our bank, that exact same account with whatever balance it is, is a liability because it's a demand deposit account and that's the way banks think of uh, accounts. It's not their money and in fact, the liability is they have to give it to you when you show up. And then if you're a payment processor, it's neither an asset nor a liability. It's something you can get at through this thing they call a linked account. But if you need to draw money, they, they know of the existence of that. So that's kind of the idea of, of thinking about the T box and the A box differently because you know they can be commingled. As you know, GIST is mostly a T box. There's a very small number of, of A box assertions in there, and they are almost entirely in the unit of measure area. You know, so we have seconds and kilograms and things like that as instances and that that forms a beginning that we can eventually add more units of measure and make conversions. This little sunburst here, and you can't quite read the things because it's shrunk down so much, but this was a, an ontology that was derived from GIST. It was color-coded. Uh, it was for a client, but this the, the right-hand part of it uh, from about 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock, the light blue there, those are all subcategories of what in GIST we call category, and that's what we're going to talk about today because it is a pretty uh, major part of most designs. So we've been using this idea of category for, for at least a decade now and it's essentially just tags that, that you can that you can use to categorize other items in the ontology. But recently we have started talking about moving it into its own namespace, talking about it differently, uh, really categorizing categories differently. Um, and what, what this talk is, is about why we're doing that and, and what's going on there. Because most of this stuff are taxonomies. Um, many of them have very little hierarchy to them, but they're taxonomies nonetheless. And because they're taxonomies, we wanted to call this the T-box, but somebody already took T-box. It's a terminological box. It isn't taxonomy box. So we're calling it C-box because they're categories. So that's where you know, we got T box, C box, and A box. Now, technically, anything that is in what we're calling the C box really is just, you know, if, if we made up a new category that we called gender, and we had two instances, male and female. I mean, this is a very classic use of, of categories or taxonomies for that matter. Uh, we're calling both that class and the instance the C box. I mean, really, that is a T box. That's a class, and yes, that is an A box. But we're gonna we're putting this uh, wrapper around this and saying let's let's treat these differently. And we'll talk about why we do that. It's mostly a scale issue. This is this is pretty much what a knowledge graph looks like to us. If if you do this well. There should be hundreds of key concepts that your ontology. There should be, these are the classes and properties um, that you really should only need a few hundred, even for the largest and most complex organization. Typically, if you, if you round up all the categories, and especially some people would treat some of their reference data uh, in this middle category here, so, so things like some geospatial or currency or unit kind of things. Um, and there will typically be thousands or tens of thousands of things in this in this part of the model. And then of course any any application or any enterprise uh, of any significance has many, many millions of triples, usually billions or, or even trillions. So there's a, 
there's a huge scale difference here, which, uh, and, and of course that is the T box, the C box, and the A box. Now let's talk about some, what, what do you get when you start splitting out this thing in the middle and treating it differently? One of the things we started doing a, a while ago, this is an old model I just found, but I started using a different symbol for the C box stuff, an upside down triangle. More recently, I, I don't connect them with lines. It just clutters things up. I'm putting them directly on the boxes. But any anything that you use to categorize something, make us a little triangle. And in a minute, we're going to see uh, how much that, that kind of simplifies the, the model and reduces clutter. This is still a little bit cluttered. but um, So this idea of, of putting a triangle on it kind of reminded me of a very uh, dopey, video. I don't know if you guys have seen this uh, in the, the Portlandia thing where they decided to put a bird. They went into this little, they go into this little shop and they decide they're going to help the shopkeeper by putting little birds on everything they find. And by the time they go through the whole thing, they put a bird on every, every single thing in their whole shop. And then a real bird comes in. It's a bit of a mess, but you know, this whole put a bird on it. That's what we're going to do here. We're going to, put a triangle on it. So one of the values uh, of taking categories out of your ontology and putting them somewhere else is, is a governance issue. When you think about it, if you've got millions or billions of things down there at the bottom, you, you don't actually govern them by hand. You, we build systems and the systems govern the data. So whatever, whatever governance is occurring uh, down there at the data level is really automated and up there at the top where there's only a few hundred concepts you can just have a handful of ontologists carefully curating and versioning and worrying about the relationships and what's happening up there and, and governance there is is also relatively easy because of because of the size um, and and you know manageable but this middle zone where we have thousands or tens of thousands of categories and people could be depending on them um, really needs a little bit of different thinking on governance. And of course, several vendors have stepped into that fray and, and actually these are great products for exactly that middle band there for, for managing uh, these taxonomies, this, this controlled vocabulary, uh, call it what you will, um, but it's, it's there kind of in that middle ground. They interestingly all sort of started as ontology products and have mostly dropped uh, their ability to, to manage the ontology itself. If, if it's there at all, it's, it's hidden, but very good for managing the, the taxonomy layer. There's some other things you get when you, when you split this out. Um, this, this stuff in the middle layer is much more suitable for things like the simple knowledge organizing system, which is essentially a, a ontology of thesaurus-like concepts, so you can have broader and narrower, things like that, which are not appropriate in the ontology because we have, because broader and narrower are sort of soft concepts. Um, they aren't ex exactly mathematical and logical, whereas over in the ontology, subclassing is absolutely, you know, derived from the, from the axioms and stuff. The other couple of things that that seem to work a lot better in that in that middle space are, you know, things you could add to the categories to if you want to make yourself found on the web better. So a lot of alternate labels and hidden labels and pref labels and language translations and all that kind of stuff that would help you be found uh, by the outside world or, you know, find things uh, internally. It works kind of similar, but, but the other way around. So that's another uh, reason for looking at doing that. If you are interested in adopting this idea of, of being more intentional about this, this middle layer here, um, there's two things you want to avoid. The first one is, is what I call the ta taxonomy first design that almost a lot of people when they get started in this, in this process, think the first thing to do is design a gigantic taxonomy and for, for reasons that have to do with Carl Linnaeus and, and uh, 
Melvin Dewey or whatever his name was, um, there's this belief that there's one giant tree that you can put everything in. And when, when you do that, you start trying to later design your classes to fit in the tree and you start realizing that you're fighting against yourself. Um, it turns out, as we'll see in a minute, it works a lot better if you get the classes first and then say, which categories do I want, you know, which, which birds do I want to pin on each category? And, and you have smaller and simpler taxonomies as a result. The other thing to avoid, and I call it the object-oriented design, because most of us are uh, descended from, descended from uh, object-oriented designers, and what we sort of learn to do is every time you learn a new concept, you go create a new subclass, and you figure out what is that a subclass of, <clears throat> and it, it leads to uh, you know, design, the more you learn, the more classes you have. And if you look at any uh, large ontology, this is exactly what happened. And I wanted to go find a bad example. Boy, that didn't take very long. I just, first thing that came up in my query was, you know, subclass, it, it's literally true. Dogs and cats are subclasses of mammals and German shepherds and poodles are subclasses of dogs. But um, if you implemented anything like that, pretty soon you'd, you'd go crazy. Um, we'll talk in a minute here about what to do instead, and, and there's a there's an interesting design decision in the middle, but the first two things I want to say is don't start with a big taxonomy to organize everything, and don't start by creating a class every time you learn something new. Instead, do this. Start with a simple model. Get it as elegant as you can. Here's the, the main class and how they relate to each other. And then every time you find something new, you want to ask yourself a couple questions. One is, given the other information I'm likely to have in this domain, would I be able to infer membership into this class? Which is, you know, it's not an absolute criteria, but it's kind of an interesting one. I'll show an example here in a minute. And especially when I go to use this ontology in real applications, is it highly likely and I want to enforce different properties for different subclasses. And these are at least candidate subclasses. So if the answers to those are yes, then yeah, go ahead and make a class. Um, if not, you know, let's, let's treat this as a tag. So for instance, you know, we always start with person. And depending on your domain, you may have uh, said, you may have discovered, gee, in this domain, there's doctors and patients. Now, uh, in, from the previous slide there, I'd, the first thing I'd say is, in my domain, do I likely have the information that I could formally uh, infer people into these different classes? And if it's a healthcare system, yeah, for sure, because you've got treatment, people are being treated, being treated by someone, you know, you almost certainly will, will have the uh, you know, you're not going to have any doctor on your staff who doesn't have a medical degree and you likely have that piece of information. So, and, and certainly you're going to be recording different information for these different classes. You know, the patients, you've got all their billing information, all that, and the doctors, you've got all their specialties and all that. And of course, unlike object oriented, if somebody happens to be both a doctor and a patient, that's fine. That's, that's not a problem. Now, if instead at this level, if you say, well, no, I want to, I want to treat doctor and patient as, as a C box, as a category, you can do that. <clears throat> I mean, you would, this is literally the design. You'd say persons are categorized by, I couldn't even think of a good way to distinguish doctors and patients here other than to say that it's their role type. But that kind of design would, will drive you nuts typically. However, if we then start getting deeper into our design and discover things like there's cardiologists and neurologists and gastroenterologists, etc. There's a temptation to want to make a class for all of them. Um, and I've seen this, HL7 started doing this with their uh, security model and it, it so much gets in the way because as you can imagine, there's now going to be, you know, hundreds of these classes, there's literally hundreds of, of, of distinctions of that. 
to this level, we'd be a much better, you know, let's put a, let's put a triangle on that. Uh, it's, it's simpler to look at, you know, and it's uh, just what, She's putting on a happy face there, but so you go down this path, there's, there's, because there's a design decision, there's a possibility to get it wrong. And there's two ways you can get this wrong. One is if you make something a class when it really could have been a category, that's one way to get it wrong. And the other is if you make something a category when really it should have been a class. And I want to go through the implications of each of these ways of getting it wrong, which kind of leads to uh, a strategy here for, for determining this. If you make something a class when it should have been a category, it's kind of hard to reverse this. You And you end up with an unnecessarily complex ontology. So instead of having a few hundred concepts, you will have a few thousand. And um, there's a huge difference between a few hundred and a few thousand. Most humans can get their heads around a few hundred things very few people can really internalize and understand and organize thousands of classes. You end up you know, piecing it and doing all that kind of stuff. And furthermore, not only is there an understanding and therefore a usage problem, um, you've now taken your maintenance and governance thing and said it all has to be done by the ontologist. Because you can't just let anyone loose into this this thing of your thousands of classes and make changes because they're potentially disrupt disruptive. Whereas when we put things over in categories and use proper tools to manage them, you know, mere mortals and subject matter experts and taxonomists and the like can handle it. So um, erring this way is, is uh, you know, harder to reverse and, and, and introduce the complexity. Now, if you err the other way, the, the first thing you think is, well, I could always refactor my, when I discover that I was treating something as a tag, and really it should have been a class, you, you first think, well, I could refactor and solve this. But it turns out you don't even need to refactor. I'll just go through this little, imagine that you treated gender as a category, as we did earlier in the presentation, and then later, change your mind. And here's what would cause you to change your mind. Let's say you built this system and then all of a sudden you realize, oh, I'm, this is actually a, a OBGYN clinic. And of course, they're going to treat men and women different. They, you know, all kinds of different, you know, women give birth and the men don't and blah, 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 all that. So let's say we naively uh, started this thing by just having gender be a, a category. So here I, I just showed the, uh, I inherited GIST, but I only showed the little bits that got used here. So gender is a category, person's an independent thing. We have three people down there, Addie, my daughter, myself, and my wife, and each of them is categorized by one of these genders. So that's what this looks like. You wake up tomorrow morning and you say, oh yeah, I, I should have had a class there. You just add the class, you can't quite read it in the middle there, but just female is a class forgot to highlight it on the left there, and it has now a formal definition. Female, the class of females is equivalent to person, and they're categorized by the has value gender female. So no matter how much data you already had, all the data about me and Addie and, and Heidi and whatnot, none of it has to be converted or changed. You just run the reasoner, and first thing it does is it figures out the class female is a subclass of person. It's pretty easy. And then Addie is, is inferred to be in that class. So Addie is a female and, and then going forward, if we had constraints or anything else on that class, we would then, you know, have to apply them. And that's, you know, that's how you correct if you made the error the wrong way. If you were too uh, aggressive in, in in using the category concept, um, this is this is how you correct for that. We say you just put a triangle on it. So there you have it. This is uh, what we call the T box, the C box, and the A box. 
Um, you know, ontologists have been separating T boxes from A boxes for decades. Um, we've introduced this idea of the category box, the C box, as we call it. Um, and by doing this, by taking all the taxonomy stuff and some of the reference data, put in that middle layer, we uh, a make our ontologies a lot simpler, make governance manageable. Um, we, you know, done right. We future proof our designs. There's a lot less uh, unnecessary churn in the design. So put a triangle on it. And with that, I'm going to stop.